This is a drum wise mix, and today I'm here with a drummer who has played with the likes of Rainbow, Hall Notes, Brand X, Blue Oyster Cult. The list is is endless, and he is the current drummer for Billy Joel, Chuck Fergie. Hi, Chuck. Hello, all. Hello, Tom. Welcome to uh, my morning. What age did you get into drums? And when you first started playing, what bands or artists inspired you? Oh man, okay. So uh, I had always, I'd grown up around a drum kit. My dad was an uh, aspiring drummer, but never took it real seriously. So I started actually seriously doing it at the age of 13. Uh, and if uh, my, uh, throwing myself into it followed seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Oh, that's been, that's an interesting answer because I've had a few people say that exact same thing. Oh so my God, all my, all my peers, most of my peers have had the same uh, experience. Billy, Phil Collins, I mean, that's just to name a few right off the top of my head. Uh, most of the guys in my band that are closer to my age all flipped out after seeing the Beatles and it changed uh, changed my life completely so awesome and when you first started what was your first drum set uh my dad had an old lady uh, it was really a uh, faded it was uh it would have been a white pearl but it had faded to yellow because he got it in the 30s i believe um so i used to bang on that and it sounded pretty good um that was my first kit was my dad's old lady kit it was a uh, a 24 by 16, a 9 by 13, and a 16 by 16 floor, and some really bad old Zildjian's, really cracked and nasty. So that was it. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing you don't still have that anymore. Uh, my my brother should still have that. He uh, he's a really good player, although he went a completely different route and became a professional actor. So uh, he's got it somewhere, I think, in storage in uh, uh, in California. Oh, awesome. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. And while we're talking about equipment, um, just for people that are interested in, in the current setup, sure. not that you've got a setup that you're using right now, but, you know, um, when, when the world is more of a normal place, what's, uh, what's your current gear setup? Oh, so I've been endorsed by Tama for a good long time, and I love them. I always wanted to be doing them and playing them. Um, I have a 24 by 16 bass drum, um, and... I'm down to one tom. I used to have three mounted toms, uh, and I played like that for most of the bands I was in, but I went down to one uh, 9 by 13 and one 16 by 16, and I have a gong drum, which I guess is a 20 inch. Uh, they're, they're pretty much uh, special to Thomas' line, and uh, they're all piano white. They're all uh, six ply maple, and uh, they're the Star Classic series. And then I also, I'm playing the Kenny Aronoff um, Chrome Over Brass uh, six and a half by 14 snare. So it's, it's pretty straight ahead. Uh, I had a much bigger kit when I first joined Billy and I realized uh, it, it was too much. You know, it, it, he, uh, I could do everything I needed on a smaller kit. It made life much easier for our sound man. And really in the bigger places we play, one tom, if it's tuned well and it's up in the mix and one floor, plus the really big one for certain effects, that's all I need for Billy. And it's also made it easier for me physically because I don't have to stretch as far and, and it's just, it's easier. So that's what I'm doing now. And while we're talking about equipment, um, going, uh, going back a while to, to the rainbow days, what was, your, uh, what was your setup there? Oh man, um, okay, so I had uh, 22 inch, uh, 14 by 22s, um, and uh, 12, 10, 12, 13, 16, 18, and they were pearls. And I gave that kit away. The kit that's on, um, let's see, live at Budokan, uh, there's a DVD of that. And that kit sounded so damn good. And I, like a fool, gave, I sold the whole thing. Uh, I sold the whole thing thinking that I would get a new kit from them that was better and it was nowhere near as good. And I had chased that type of kit until I finally got, got together with Tama back in the beginning of 2000, 2001. 
So that was it. It was a great kit. Um, back then, I was also playing uh, clear single ply uh, tom heads, and uh, I've, I've ended up hitting harder, so I really can't use those. I do. Though they were all ambassadors, and they record and sound so good, but they didn't last long. And uh, now I can't play them at all. I just hit too hard. So. Cool. Yeah. Now. This uh, this next question, a few people have found uh, to be quite a tough one. So let's see where this uh -oh. goes. Um, uh -oh. And I'll start with a disclaimer here. I would find this one hard to answer myself. Um, <laughs> so if you had to pick just one, who would be your all time favorite drummer? Ringo. Easy. Yeah, it, it's so easy because um, I grew up being a uh, being in love with songs. Um, um, and in America that ruled the airwaves while I was growing up. And when I was younger, you could hear Motown, you could hear the English bands, you could hear, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tom Jones, you could hear just a potpourri of the best music of the time. And, uh, I was a song guy. So when I heard the Beatles and when I watched Ringo and I'd listened to his playing, he swinged. He swung uh, so good and still does. And and I think um, you can't ask for more. He had great time. He had great fills uh, all throughout his career. He had great tone. And uh, man, I, I've tried to emulate him for years. I still do at times because he was the benchmark for rock and roll. And I think he still is. So Ringo, now that's easy. And I really thought about this because uh, I've had a lot of time on my hands, Tom. I haven't been traveling and uh, having to perform. So, uh, yeah, definitely Ringo. But then if I made it a bit easier and said, uh, you know, give us a few other influences that have really sort of shaped your drumming, who else would be on your list? Okay, so I, I grew up loving uh, songs. So Ringo was probably the, the first biggest influence. But um, in America, there was a band called The Ventures, and they had many, many uh, hits on the radio, and they were instrumental. So I bought a couple of their albums, and I don't even remember the guy's name, right, because I, it's been so long, but the drummer in that band, and then when I transitioned from the Beatles, I got into Jimi Hendrix, and Mitch Mitchell was an enormous influence on my playing, uh, probably more, more so than Bonham, and all those guys, I just loved his hands, I loved his busyness, and I had, uh, in junior high and high school, I primarily had a trio. So I thought the way to fill that space was just uh, admirably demonstrated by Mitch Mitchell. So from Mitch Mitchell, it went to Tony Williams, who was in a band with John McLaughlin, which was the precursor to Mahavishnu Orchestra called Emergency. And uh, Tony Williams then bridged the gap from uh, from uh, Jimmy's music into what was full-blown fusion, and that was, uh, I thought, Mahavishnu in odd times. And so, uh, and Billy Cobham was was huge in my life for so many years. Um, and then and then it became everybody, Steve Gadd, uh, Harvey Mason, uh, you know, it just went on and on. But I think that was the, that was the progression for me initially. Um, yeah. Excellent. That's a good list. Cool. Now, my next question, um, I think for you, um, just, you know, reading the list of the, the things that you've done in your career, uh, you know, the, the artists you've played for, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, uh, you know, to, to be just to be talking to you about this is just is great. Um, but um, if you if you could narrow it down, uh -huh. what's been the highlight of your career so far? Oh, um, hmm. I think ultimately I'd have to say joining Billy's band. Um, joining Billy brought me full circle to being a player who is in a song band, uh, which is really what I grew up loving. <clears throat> and I, I went way out, <clears throat> excuse me, I went way out when I joined Brand X. And I, 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 I think for years I wanted to be, you know, a lead drummer. I still do. When I'm home, I practice lead drummer stuff, stuff I may never use again on a record or whatever. Um, but um, joining Billy's 
and, and being in his band and working with him as an artist and a songwriter has definitely taken me into the stratosphere, not just because of the artist he is, but because of the gigs we've done. And I would cite our two shows at Shea Stadium back in 2008. I can't believe it's 12 years already, but where I got a chance to not only uh, be on stage with Billy in front of almost 60,000 people, but um, I, I, I was able to play Walk This Way with Steven Tyler. I was able to play My Generation with Roger Daltrey. And I finished that whole two nights uh, playing two songs with Paul McCartney, who, when I was growing up, the Beatles started Stadium Rock. They were the beginning at Shea Stadium. So to all these years later to kind of sew up my life and what I aspired to do by playing with not only Sir Paul McCartney, but at Shea Stadium and with Billy was, uh, it's really going to be hard to top in my life. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good uh, career highlight right there. <laughs> <laughs> While we're talking about your career, um, obviously off camera, I mentioned to you, um, you know, my, uh, my, my current, uh, well, in a normal situation, my current band, um, yeah. Purple Zeppelin, so it's a tribute to Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, and there's obviously a connection there with, with Rainbow. So yeah. uh, if you wouldn't mind, you know, talk to us about, um, you know, the, the Rainbow days <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and just some, some, cool stuff there. I would love to. Well, first of all, um, when I was growing up and the first Deep Purple album hit the airwaves in America with Hush, um, and that was the first incarnation of, I think, that band, that blew my mind. And Richie's guitar playing thrilled me. And then at the end of my high school, uh, I think uh, Machine Head came out. So that blew my mind. And I was in a band without keyboards, so we really couldn't go near any of that stuff. And nobody could sing, you know, that stuff. So we didn't ever cover them. But <clears throat> joining Richie was really one of the highlights of my life. Um, he's a fierce guitar player. He's a funny man. Um, I loved a lot of their, I loved most of their music from the album's past with Cozy or Bobby Rondinelli on drums. And um, uh, it was uh, it was overwhelming because, you know, I hadn't played in a metal band, I, I, the Queen call them metal, they were hard rock, but I hadn't played in a band like that on that level ever. And so the challenge uh, for me was uh, was huge. I ended up recording uh, Bent Out of Shape at, at, at a last minute uh, get you know call from Roger and Joey. I had auditioned for Rainbow and Richie did, for some reason, just passed on me. And uh, I started recording Roger's solo album, which was a, a, an album called The Mask, and was very eclectic and funky, but uh, uh, he had to stop recording and doing that to go and produce the Rainbow album, which they spent about 10 days in Copenhagen trying to record and got nothing with the drummer that Richie had wanted, who was brand new to the business. So they called me up and I flew over and really uh, sight unseen started recording uh, Been Out of Shape. So, uh, and then from there, I was sure, Richie and I banged heads a bunch of times in the studio, and I was sure that I wasn't going to work with them after completing the record. Uh, but a couple of weeks later, uh, their manager called me up and said, do you fancy coming on the road? And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, we got to go on the road, and Richie would like you to join the band. So I was like, you've got to be kidding. Of course. So it was really a highlight. It really was. Uh, working with the band, Joey and I, uh, Joe Ling Turner, uh, he and I have been old friends. Um, and, uh, man, um, it was, uh, it was an incredible experience. That's all, that's all I can say, you know, everything from, uh, from, uh, being on a song that was on the radio, um, which was Street of Dreams in America and on MTV videos, uh, uh was just extraordinary, um, to be in a band with Joe again, because I had been in a band called Fandango with him and help that original band uh, get their first deal with RCA. But then I left to start playing fusion um, and uh, I never recorded again with them. But um, in any case, so Rich, so Joey and I go way back and I was always just a super fan of Richie's guitar playing. And uh, I ended up being in Richie's band kind of twice uh, back in 83, where we recorded Been Out of Shape and then the compilation um, uh, final vinyl 
And then uh, back in 95, I got a call from a good, a good friend and a great bass player, uh, Greg Smith, to ask me if I wanted to tour again with Rainbow on an album that I didn't play on called um, Stranger in a Soul. Uh, and I did that. We did that for about a year and a half. And it was absolutely a mind, another mind-boggling experience going back to Japan, going back through all of Europe where I had been with them 12 years earlier, whatever the math is. And uh, I had a blast. And so after being in the studio with Richie, every time I played live with him, we just clicked. We got along. Very little was needed to say. Uh, he let me play the songs the way I thought they should go. Uh, and, um, and it was a blast. It was just an absolute blast. And I think that 95 into 96, uh, I had never heard Richie play better live. So it was a real thrill. Plus, I was working with an old friend uh, and having laughs galore and playing so well with Greg Smith, who's, who's he and I have, we feel time the same way. And when you hook up with somebody like that, uh, like Billy's bass player, uh, Andy C. Sean, he and I now feel time like that also. Took a little work, but uh, Greg and I hit it off uh, with that special vibe right away. So, but Richie was unbelievable and fun and funny and uh, he was definitely, uh, I referred to him as a Lord, uh, Lord Blackmore. Uh, and and, I, and my, most of the time I would say Squire to him. Morning Squire, evening Squire. And uh, he loved that because I think in his mind, he, you know, he's, he was rock royalty and he was. So anybody who wants to entertain that about themselves, I'll, uh, you know, I'll certainly, uh, I'll be a part of that. Excellent. Now, obviously, talking about your career there and, you know, all of the different artists that you have worked with, um, yeah. getting on to a, a question here, uh, kind of an education based question, really. So when you first get a gig with a new artist, how do you learn the material? So, um, you know, do you just listen and, oh, you know, I've got it straight away? Or do you listen and then you transcribe it? Or are you given a whole folder and, you know, here you go, Chuck, here's the entire folder written out in drum music? That's a good question because I, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you before we started that I didn't ever study deeply enough to really know drum music well. So uh, I've had to read charts on and off over the years, but they've been primarily like horn charts. So I'd read uh, just simple stuff. Um, most of the time I joined a band and I learned stuff, it was all by ear. Uh, Brand X, I can't believe I remembered stuff like that and we would record these long, crazy songs. But, but back then I had a really good uh, memory and because I grew up primarily learning drums by ear, which I regret now uh, because to, to fast forward, uh, I've started working with some artists who make really good demos. So how I learn those demos now is I try badly to transcribe them uh, because I've learned uh, through a very painful process that if somebody gives me a demo uh, and they've really done a lot and or they tell me that they're not going to, they're going to keep the guitar, they're going to keep the vocal, they're going to keep the bass part, um, I really need to know every moment that was on their demo, if it was played by another drummer, if it was played by a machine, if it was programmed by them. So I have started in the last, I'd say two years to transcribe. As I said, badly, I don't, it takes me forever. And I probably to this moment still have charts that aren't correct, but I at least know what I meant. Uh, and uh, most recently I'm doing a, a, a recording with uh, some friends uh, a friend, but two friends uh, uh, collectively uh, that I was I was in a band with them in 1983 called Balance, and uh, the singer sent me a, what he wants to have be a tribute song, and it is so it's a lot of double bass, not too fast, but very very uh, syncopated, and I started thinking I can do my own thing, and and it was like no I have to I have to write this out, so I've got a three page chart that's really syncopated. And when I started trying to record my own stuff, it was basically just to do what he had programmed. So I would suggest to anybody to get your book as a, as a beginner 
and learn transcription because it'll it it will never go out of style and never be uh, inapplicable to something you want to do. It'll also uh, solidify in your brain how how the rhythms are broken down and and how best to make cheat sheets if you need to. Um, to uh, and to be exact about it because most of my cheat sheets were just verse chorus double chorus bridge eight bars you know they were very very simple and because i had a good ear uh, i could follow that but you know that only goes so far and and uh and i think it would behoove any younger drummer and anybody aspiring to be a professional to know notation inside out yeah good advice and just what you said about the brand x stuff learning that like just by from memory like oh that must that must have hurt <laughs> it did it, it did hurt um that experience was especially uh nerve-wracking because uh i had been a big fan of the bands and i just happened to be in the right place at the right time uh, but in any case there were a couple of songs that we recorded on the album i did that had been lying around for a year or so and uh, the guitarist was set, he played me one of the, the, the opening song on the album, The Poke, and he, he played it to me and said, nobody could figure out how to play this. And I was like, oh, really? So I had a little boom box I used to travel with, and I said, play me the whole thing to, as you hear it. And I can remember listening to it and then looking at him going, so where's one? And he looked, fucked if I know. And I was like, oh, no, what? So I, I spent a better part of a week listening to that and sweating over it every night and finally had a breakthrough moment and was like, oh, I know how I could play that. But if I had to notate it, that would have been impossible. Uh, John, the guitarist who wrote the song, didn't read music. Percy, who was the bass player and founding member of the band, he didn't read music either. So uh, three of the five of us were, were illiterate as far as notation went. Uh, and the other two guys in the band, were they were graduates of the Royal Academy of Music. So, yeah. Awesome. So, um, moving on to my, my next question, we've talked about um, career highlights. Um, this one is, is kind of uh, the opposite of that, really. Um, uh, you know, it's a kind of a juicy gossip question, this one. So, have you, <laughs> have you ever had anything go wrong on stage that you've had to recover from that you can tell us about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've, uh, more than once when I first joined Billy in front of, you know, big crowds. Uh, I counted the wrong song off. Like I had just skipped a song in the set. I started crying and I go and I hit the first downbeat and he's looking at me like, look at your set. Okay. And he loved that stuff. I mean, he's just all about live. So that happened several times. Um, um, let's see what else. Uh, and I'm definitely I've, I've, I've gone for a fill. And, and completely screwed them up. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, I remember having uh, my seat when we were doing one of the first Madison Square Garden shows, sold out. Uh, I remember having my seat just in the middle of the song, split in half. And, uh, and I was really lucky that the, re the, the remaining seat didn't insert itself into me, uh, but uh, I had to keep playing. It was the middle of a song, so I was, I'm kind of, crouched there trying to play time uh, and it definitely you know suffered until my guy could like holy shit get another seat and bring it up and replace it so that and then i've had sticks uh i've had stick shards fly in my eye and be blinded i've cut myself really badly and have blood all over everywhere and uh, and i've had sticks fly out of my hand uh, uh i've had cymbals break um I've broken a bass drum head uh, once or twice in the middle of a song, so that that ends up being uh, really painful, and you kind of screech to the end of the song, and uh, and then have to like hold on, you got to just talk for a minute. I've got technical issues, so yeah, I think uh, if you've been lucky enough to play live as much as I have, pretty much everything you can think you could go wrong at some point has gone wrong with me, and I've made pretty much all those mistakes. Um, yeah, I think uh, the kind of the reason I came up with that question in the first place is just, you know, I know that a lot of my students when they watch this will be pleased to know that someone that's playing like Madison Square Garden or whatever, you know, that that happens to them. So yeah. I think 
Yeah, I mean, we're all human. A, B, uh, shit happens. Uh, and, um, uh, y you know, if, if you're lucky to be with an artist or in a group that are, are, are good friends, then, you know, first of all, everybody knows I'm well-intentioned and I'm trying to do the best job possible. But if I screw up, I'm human. And, uh, and when I first joined Billy, there were, uh, there were tempo problems because I had been in the, uh, there were, there were tempo problems I would have, uh, because I was unused to playing a lot of his songs at the tempo that he wanted to play them. I had been playing them really fast in moving out, which was the Broadway show that I did for almost three and a half years before joining Billy. So my muscles were, and my whole brain was so totally into playing these really, really up, up tempo songs of his. And when I first joined him, it took me about a year to deprogram my muscles. So there were a lot of things like, one, two, three, and we'd start and he'd be like, pull it back, pull it back. And be like, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I just think that uh, you have to, you know, one of the things about live for me is you have to give it a thousand percent. Um, and if you don't, then you're you're cheating yourself or, or uh, failing on your end and failing for the audience because they want to see you giving everything. Um, so in the process of doing that, uh, there's a lot of things that can occur. And uh, I think they're a part of the live territory. You know, I always broke um, music down into two categories, uh, trying to be pretty good and entertaining and, uh, and competent live, and then trying to be pretty good and uh, competent in the studio, because they're really two different worlds. So I always tried to do the, my best in both, but they're, they're completely different. And I know I, I used to see some guys who make great records and I go and watch them. And I was like, man, is that guy boring? Yeah. And there's, he's not even smiling. He's not even looking like he's having fun. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's two different worlds and live shit happens. Pardon my, ex, my friend. It's all good. Excellent. Now, um, we're on to a couple of curveball questions here, Chuck. So um, my first uh, curveball question for you is, what are your hobbies away from drums? Well, uh, I, I love to draw, but I haven't done that whole lot lately um that used to be one of my um kind of go-to things because i traveled so much i always had a, a sketch pad uh i love to write um kind of in a diary uh and i absolutely uh drawn to trying to uh, describe a day or a moment or an experience uh using the language uh color colorfully uh, so I, I love good writing. Not that I am a good writer, but I, I will write uh, substantially. And probably in the last 12 years, 10 years, I've had a home studio. So getting good at that is a full-time job. Uh, I don't have a second person to, uh, to help me. So just kind of integrating all the things I didn't really pay attention to when I was doing records, because I usually work with great engineers, becoming a great engineer, knowing mics, knowing software. That's, that has become uh, my second go-to thing I do, uh, other than still trying to stay in shape as a player, uh, is, is getting better. I use Logic uh, Pro as my DAW, and then uh, and getting, uh, getting familiar with all that a DAW can do now, and being my own producer and editor, that's a full-time job. Just, just getting good at that. And it's something I would encourage younger uh, drummers to become familiar with because you cannot just rely on being a live player or even a studio player at this point. You need to be uh, a much broader uh, and more capable artist than ever before because the tools that are available to us are astounding. So, yeah. so I would yeah. say being, uh, being in my studio is now my second hobby um uh yeah excellent cool and i i know where you i certainly like know where that where you're going with that because uh i've you know this this lockdown and stuff i've been recording tracks for people here and you know just even down to just 
mic placement and just oh, kind of invested in different mics and oh it's just a, a rabbit hole isn't it it, uh, it is a black hole and as a matter of fact um i've got a visit uh, from a good friend of mine who actually lives right next door at one town away uh, his name's steve brown uh, he produced the last two albums i did with our uh, hard uh, i would say melodic hard rock band called tokyo motor fist uh, he was also uh, in a band called Trickster in the 90s who had a more than platinum selling record. I think they did a, a couple of albums, but he also was the go to guitar player, lead guitar player and vocalist with uh, when Def Leppard needed him over the last five years. So he's an amazing talent and he's one of these guys that is a king in the studio. So I have him coming to help me tweak my my kit, my mic placement, uh, and it was on his uh, his order. That is like if, if you can do this and you can afford it, get yourself to Audio Technica um, uh, condenser mics uh, because I, he says I think they're the best for the money uh, as overheads. And I have uh, AKG 451s uh, as they as it is, but he's like I think you'll like these better. So within the next hour, I expect to have his expertise and his knowledge being in uh, you know instilled on me, and hopefully he's gonna expand my uh, awareness of everything I can do in this place because the gear it's an it's mics uh, software uh, it's crazy you know and uh, I just recently bought this uh, this camera because I was sick of uh, only speaking and looking into my little laptop and the little camera and that which worked great but this is actually set up in my studio here and I can see you big enough now to uh, to feel like we're kind of room to room with each other so yeah, oh, awesome. yeah. and uh, my my next curveball question um which we've had some really interesting answers uh, on and um, what's your favorite cookie my favorite cookie is yeah. I, i'm so deaf i just what's my favorite cookie yeah well i'm really lucky my wife amy goff is an amazing singer and cook and she has come up with my favorite cookie, which is a combo of three different types of chips, uh, white chocolate, dark chocolate, and uh, milk chocolate uh, as a chocolate chip cookie. And uh, they're the best cookies I've ever had in the world. I try not to ever eat them because my metabolism just wants to put them anywhere but into my system and get rid of them. So they'll, you know, it's, but they're my favorite cookie. Multi chocolate chip cookies. Awesome. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> so, um, my last, uh, like back to the like serious question again now. Um, sure. So, if you could give just one bit of advice to people starting out playing the drums, what would that advice be? Mm, I think it's multi level. Uh, looking back on my luck, uh, you, you have to look for opportunities. Um, even if you don't believe in yourself, if you believe in yourself enough to put yourself out into uh, a situation where you can audition, where you can meet people, even if that fails, you've made new friends. So you have to be uh, aggressive in terms of taking every opportunity and making opportunities. I used to go into a place that held auditions in New York City. Um, I used to take the bus in and go to this place and just read the bulletin boards. Um, there were also, uh, there were, uh, there was a paper where that you, I could buy month, weekly that had listings for um, band needs drummer, things like that. I went to millions of auditions cold without ever calling anybody. Um, and I think you have to, if you're gonna be an artist, you just have to be aggressive. Uh, and if you, it depends on what you want. If you wanna be, a um, you know, a live at home producer drummer, uh, you still need to meet people, you still need to meet friends, you still need to network. So you can't be afraid to go out to, to, to be turned down. Uh, every opportunity uh, is has got potential for um, growth and for more contacts. And it's a small world in the music business. And uh, the more people you know, the better off you're going to be. So I would say more than anything is just keep taking those risks, put yourself out there, uh, try and, I used to make uh, demo tapes on cassette 
with a with with one microphone in a room with a band I was playing with, just to have something to give somebody, and whether they even listened to it, at least I had something. Um, so these days the technology is so much better. Even with an iPhone, you can make a great recording. So I I really think it's you know have faith in yourself even if you don't, <laughs> because I think most people will find that. Uh, that everybody doubts their ability, everybody doubts their uh, capacity to fulfill somebody else's uh, needs. And so if you just recognize that, you go, you go out and put yourself into situations where it's either an audition um, and, or whatever, uh, it does nothing but raise people's awareness of you and raise your ability to keep, to keep putting yourself out there. Because even if you get a great gig, that's going to end. You have to keep going if you want to have a career and you have to know people and you have to be unafraid of meeting new people and maybe even reinventing yourself. Like if I had just chosen to be a metal drummer, I wouldn't still be working. If I had chosen to just be a, a, a rock drummer, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have joined Brand X. I, I think you can't stop trying to grow in terms of n your knowledge and you can't stop in terms of the people you meet and the opportunities you create. So that's that's the long-winded version. Chuck, thank you so much for spending your time with us at Drumwise today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Tom. I'm, I'm looking at your face and I'm looking at the camera and I'm sure everybody watching this is gonna see me doing this, but I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about my career, which I've been really fortunate to, uh, to have, uh, and also have worked really hard to create. And so this is a, this is a blessing to be able to talk about it and blab about it. And it's been a real pleasure to meet you, meet your audience. And I, I wish you uh, a tons of luck in your future endeavors, whether it's with the band, whether it's with you sitting at home and blogging and vlogging uh, and, uh, and teaching. And uh, certainly everybody should buy your book because it looks like you know, the, creating a knowledge of, of notation and, and getting that foundation, I think, is primary to being a successful drummer. So, thanks, Chuck.